In the spirit of accelerating innovation, where do you start? Well, we think you start by thinking about how you lead. Leadership matters, and that concept, that theme, has been woven into every conversation that you have had throughout this entire conference. Innovation requires all of us to lead different. McKinsey did a study, a global study, and they interviewed executives in finance, and they asked, is innovation critical to your success in the future? And guess what you answered? You could talk to me. Yes, yes. And then they came back with, we believe it is critical to our success in the future, but we admit we're slow adopters. And then McKinsey said, okay, well what? If you think about the big picture here, what what drives innovation in organizations? And you know what the executives said? They said three primary drivers in most every organization. Ratan Tata didn't just drive through the streets of India on a normal afternoon monsoon. Does it every single day. On this particular day, for some reason, he was called upon to notice something that happens before him all the time. And he didn't just notice, then he committed and then he got totally involved in trying to fix it. Trying to innovate a solution around that tragedy that happens a lot. What does what is noticing look like? Noticing only happens when you do more than just commit. Noticing happens when you get involved. I was doing an event for another healthcare institution in San Diego, and you know, they were talking about patient experiences. And the chief of staff was on stage and he said, I gotta tell you about a very unfortunate customer letter that I got. And what he described is he described a patient who was in the hallway looking for the pharmacy and he saw someone in scrubs and that patient said I'm confused I can't find the pharmacy and the person in scrubs said oh it's right down there and around the corner and then that patient said you know what that's funny because if I was at Vons my local grocery store they would have escorted me to the pharmacy the deal here is is we can't just we can't just point we can't just bench, benchmark other healthcare institutions our patients are coming to us with experiences that they have in the grocery store at the car dealership at the gas station at McDonald's and Tata did is he commissioned a young design team average age 28 and they did it they nanovated. They created a car that is not an apology car, but is an, a safe all-weather form of transportation. They, they realized the vision, they embraced the vision, they got in it, they led through so many challenges, so many naysayers, and they ultimately disrupted the automotive industry. We have dedicated our careers to, to looking at, to studying, to recognizing best places, where the best people can do their best work to make the world better. That's a huge outcome. I want you to know that I've done my homework. I had a lot of time on the phone with a number of you. I literally had phone calls lined up on my agenda like airplanes on a runway. And I learned a lot. My journey started in graduate school. So my doctoral dissertation, I'm gonna study leadership. And you know what? <clears throat> I started with one of the best companies in the world, Southwest Airlines, but what I will tell you is I will tell you I did not study him. And he is a phenomenal leader. Let me introduce you to him. This is Herb Kelleher, the Chairman Emeritus and the founder of Southwest Airlines. My husband studied him in his dissertation and claimed that Herb Kelleher is a transformational leader, and I believe he is. But as I was watching that study unfold, I realized 
we needed to do more for leadership because I don't believe in my head and I don't believe in my heart that leadership is about a white guy that sits at the top of a corporate pyramid. When you can find a way to overlap what you're really good at, what you love to do, what you're passionate about with what needs to get done at work, boom, alive, engaged, passionate, committed, loyal, on fire. You might go back tomorrow and you might go, hey, got these great ideas. And you know what we want, you know, you know, you're all fired up and you tell them this is what we're gonna do different, and you try and engage them in the enthusiasm that hopefully you've gained. And they're gonna listen and they're gonna be good. And then you know what they're gonna do? They're gonna wait for you to leave, and then they're all gonna look at each other and they're gonna go, just give it a couple days. <laughs> this always happens. If we give them a couple days, it'll go away and they'll get stuck back in the grind. Don't let that happen. Now Kevin and I call those people dead people working. And Ken is famous for calling those people or saying they have quit, but they stay, right? Well, if 75-ish if percent of the population is disengaged, quit but stayed, dead people working, then are they really your most valuable assets? This is Diesel. He's an English bulldog. How many of you are dog lovers? How many of you, I have to ask this question, aren't? There's always a few of us in the room. I'm not a dog lover, and my husband convinced me that the family needed a dog. We're an extremely active family. Did we get the right dog? <laughs> what are bulldogs known for? I need a dog I can run with. Diesel couldn't run. Change begins with you. You won't change the world. You won't change Switzerland. You won't change your company until you change you. So the question that I ask you is this, how big is your piece of society? If Ratan Tata's piece of society is India, if Herb Kelleher's was Texas and then it grew to the United States and then it grew globally, how big is your piece of society? What questions are you willing to ask yourself and then your team to help you create and inspire change? And what's fascinating about that is if you look at the most innovative companies in the world today, what you will find and what you will discover is the leaders in those most innovative companies are involved. They're not just committed to it. Years and years ago, I used to run the, the Center for Quality and Productivity at the University of San Diego. And we'd host executive sessions where we'd invite in the executives who ran the companies all over the San Diego County area. And we'd talk to them about the importance. Quality was the, the obsession back then. We'd talk to them about the importance of quality. And those executives, they'd say, yeah, we're committed to quality. And then they'd go back to their organizations and they'd go to the people in the quality assurance department and say, do it. Bring quality to our organization. That's commitment. And what we'd tell them back then, 20 or so years ago, is we'd say, it, it, it won't work. It just won't work. If you simply commit to quality, it is not good enough. You have to get involved in the quality movement as well. And that's true for culture, that's true for engagement, and that's so very true for innovation. We've got to get away from the mindset that says that innovation happens at an innovation center because that's what that group does. Innovation happens 
off site because we can think ever so clearly over there. That's not what innovation is. And what the trends tell us is that the largest purchasing power in the world is the she economy. It's a $20 trillion economy and her needs are far different from their needs or his needs. And these women said, if we want to tap into that incredibly loyal she economy, we better understand her. So they did their research and what they discovered is they discovered this, which is a surprising thing actually if you look at the data. 60% of wine drinkers are women. Women buy 80% of wine that is purchased. 80% of women that were surveyed are not happy with their appearance for some reason or another. 45% of them are on a diet. Most women who drink wine want less of that buzz, or Behringer likes to call it fuzz factor that happens when you drink wine. And then the women went deeper. And what they discovered is they said there's a physiological reason why women want less fuzz factor because physiologically when a man drinks a glass of wine, his body will metabolize 30% of the wine or the alcohol. A woman's body will only metabolize about 10% of the alcohol. So we can have the same glass of wine, but I'm way more buzzed than he is. <laughs> And they don't like that. At least that's what the survey respondents said. So you know what these women did? Is they said, well, let's look at a trend. And the trend in California wines is this. You leave grapes on the vine for long hang time. Because the longer they hang on the vine, the more fruit forward, which means the more alcohol, and then the more sugar, which is the more calories. So the women said, hey, let's disrupt the process. And what they suggested and what they ultimately innovated is this. They pulled the grapes early, thus early season Chardonnay. It has less sugar, therefore less calories, and a little less alcohol. They noticed because they looked at the trends. And then they led through it and they disrupted and they created an innovation. Are you learning like crazy? The first question was, how much time do you dedicate toward clicking versus bricks? Well, I would ask you to take a few steps back and say, if you look at how much time you have or you think you might invest in creating some kind of an online site, are you not doing that because psychologically you're just not up for it? Or are you not doing it because your customers just don't need it? What's the reason why you're not doing it? In times of drastic change, it's the learners who will inherit the future. You don't have to do it all your own. There are young kids who live technology. My kids can text better than they can communicate. And I'm sure many of yours can too. You don't have to do it all. Invest in and invite in people who are young and alive and love technology. They can help you.